Walsh, welcome to the Development by David podcast. How are you really, my friend? I am happy. I've just spoken to my team in Ukraine and I feel very hopeful about what we're doing there. Uh, and I'm also just got to Krakow, which is a city I enjoy working with refugee volunteers here in the next couple of days. So right now I feel pretty good. I saw on your Instagram you did this exercise where you asked this this wonderful woman how she was and she gave like kind of generic fine answer and then you said rate actually rate how you are out of 10 being 10 the most enjoyable or the most happy or the most fulfilled you've ever been how would you rate yourself today well well i gave more complex that so just to sort of speak to what you're saying first most people don't tell the truth for this they just either because they don't know it, because they're not tuned into themselves, they're not embodied, as I would say in my language, um, or that they they know, but they're kind of scared to say it. it's a vulnerability issue, you know, and it's okay to have the social ritual, I'm fine, how are you, mate? All right, all right, how are you? Great. Um, but if you actually want to build that muscle of leadership, of emotional intelligence, of mindfulness, all of these things are combined, then actually feeling yourself and going, well, actually, how am I really then that's the first skill then if you want to build real connection and intimacy you might want to share some of that because otherwise you're living in your own little isolated world so i could i could answer that in layers right i could go like okay like physically i've been in the gym so i can feel my muscles just kind of a feeling i like and um i feel kind of i feel bright the sun's out I had a sort of flirty interaction not long ago it was fun i feel uplifted by sort of life purpose And then underneath that, another layer, I'm fucking exhausted, mate. Like another layer is I'm this close to burnout just from running a company and moving house. And I can tell you about all the things, but there's another part of me that's just drained. And this is, if we're going to really answer that question that people ask all over the world of how are you, honestly, often there's layers. You know, like you caught me in a really genuinely good mood. Like five hours ago, you sat on EasyJet going, oh my God, I'm tired of marketing meetings. I'm tired of running a business. I can't hack it anymore. You know, like most people in work in an office, because I've got two jobs really. You know, one is I teach embodiment, leadership, trauma, stress management. The other one is I run a company that does that. You know, that's like a normal person job. And um, I definitely know which of those jobs I like more. And being burning so close to the wire or burning so close to the the candle um what what gets you through this period where you feel like upcoming burnout is almost imminent again layers or so i i mean i do all the right things you know i do the meditation the cold showers the gym uh nature i talk about eco regulation as well as self regulation nature's a big thing for me walking in the park or swimming in the sea i'm just looking at beautiful green trees outside and um you know asking my wife for support being able to reach out for help being able to communicate with my colleagues to let them know okay you might need to take a bit of work off me here if that's possible um so if anyone says how do you avoid burnout and they give you one answer you need a whole set of skills from communication skills to you know self-awareness skills to things you can do about it and then being inspired being on purpose you know those of us which i definitely have that's super energizing and just but it's also dangerous (laughs) so you gotta be that's a double-edged sword the reason I asked that, Mark, was because I would categorize myself as having burnt out over the last month. This is my second episode back of the podcast. I removed the podcast from my life from, for an efficiency point of view. I had work exams and work commitments that I had to dance around. So the low-hanging fruit that I could rip off and forget about was the podcast. But I realized yeah. I lost part of my identity right. doing that. And I didn't know who I was anymore. I was just... Taking, the, I was attaching myself to my to-do list, and now that I'm back podcasting two episodes back, I realise this is what gives me my energy, and I solemnly swear to myself that I will never ditch it for it's a non-negotiable moving forward, um, because I do tie it to my identity and who I am. Yeah, I mean anything tied to identity is a, a risk, you know. Certainly from a Buddhist background, I've got to be very careful saying I am this because it puts one in a box, you know. Uh, though I would say if it's clearly something that inspires you that you love 
and you know, I can see a guitar in the background there. You know, there's lots of things in life that aren't productive or efficient, but actually give us energy. And I'll stay up all night doing something I love. And then I won't have energy for half an hour of doing some accountancy thing that I can't be bothered to get my head around. You know? <laughs> so like, like actually is when I'm coaching people on this, or like I have mentees and I coach them on purpose and finding purpose. And it's like, well, what can you do all day long? You know? And sometimes they say, oh, something really fun, like dancing. I'm like, well, hang on. Have you ever tried <laughs> dancing for 40 hours a week? You know, like, like, you know, uh, what can you, what gives you that energy? So for me, it's such a weird thing to go, okay, I've got to be careful I don't have a burnout. So I'm going to go to a war zone and teach people for trauma about, about trauma seven days in a row for 12 hours a day. But I'm well looking forward to it. I'm well up for it. <laughs> if there was a sentence to entice a listener already, I think it was that last one, Mark. For the listener's <laughs> sake, <laughs> how would you describe who you are and what you do today in 2022? Who I am, a bit of a wanker. <laughs> that's that's definitely how I would describe who I am um, in terms of what I do. So I run an embodiment training company. So I'm an embodiment teacher. What the hell does that mean? It means I help people come home to the body to learn a set of skills that are extremely useful for leadership, for stress management, for pretty much any area of life because we're cognitively trained. Um, you know, our school system, our culture values, like, let's take podcasts. Oh, I love podcasts. I listen to probably about an hour of podcasts a day minimum, you know, whether it's Joe Rogan or what about fitness or what about embodiment, whatever. Um, but that's information, right? And all the information in the world is not going to save your ass. Like Wikipedia hasn't solved all the world's problems. You know, I sometimes joke, you know, if you someone said I'd read a lot of books on being a good lover, You'd, you'd, you wouldn't be that impressed, would you? you know, or a lot of books on being a good driver, you wouldn't be that impressed. Whereas embodiment's very much like, okay, what's not theoretical? So leadership, well, relationships, uh, dealing with your stress, whether it be daily stress or you know extreme war zone stress, whatever, these things are skill sets and they're skill sets where the body really matters. And if we think of the body just as a sort of piece of meat or as a sort of, you know, taxi to carry our head around, we're going to miss actually the main thing that the body's doing, which is, it is the heart of who we are. And it's, I study how we are. So this is this question you started with how we are, right? But if you actually break that question down, what is the manner of our ontology? Like what is the mechanism through we, which we construct ourselves? And you could add to that relationally. That's embodiment. So how someone sits, breathes, moves, like intuitively you get a sense of this, you know? I was in the airport today in Gatwick and there was someone there and I just went, I need to talk to you. And she's like, who are you? I'm like, I'm Mark Walsh, who the fuck are you? And we just immediately hit it off. She's an actress, we're having loads of fun. You know, we immediately just giggling and being cheeky. And I picked up and she's, uh, she's she, and we, so I was like, what kind of meditation do you do? And she's like, how do you know I meditate? I was like, I can <laughs> tell, I can tell. We're just way more present than everyone else is fucking going to EasyJet at Gatwick, you know? And um, we're, I'm sure we're going to be friends. We're already making lots of jokes and having a good time. And um, yeah, those, the skill sets involved are very concrete. So if, that was kind of a poetic answer, but I teach body awareness, self-regulation, social awareness and leadership. They're the four skill sets of embodied intelligence that i could break down more mark this is just fantastic i love this conversation already where did the seed for this become planted was there a pivotal moment in your life where you realized there was a detachment between cognitive learning and embodied learning right so there's this planet and it was falling apart so my parents put me in a capsule and they fired me in <laughs> <laughs> no, that's super bad origin story, but how'd you go? Did it? I love a good origin story. Yeah, I got, I got I've been interviewed a lot and I always try and keep it fresh, right? But often I because I want to I don't just want to like tr you know roll off the same other thing. Um it's something about like really being fresh feel like I never made that joke before. Um and you can tell when something's fresh, so I try and keep it spontaneous. But what I keep coming back to when I'm interviewed or when I'm doing a training the trainees will turn around at the same point and go, how did you get into this? Right? Like they get, they get curious about me rather than just the content after a while or I lead with it if it's interesting to them. And in many ways, my 
story is the story of Western civilization. Uh, analogous, shall we say, without being too grandiose. So I was super clever cognitively as a kid. Now, I, I came from a pretty rough background. Uh, my dad was an alcoholic, Irish immigrant family, um, grew up in a sort of working class farm village in the Fens, which I always describe to my American friends as like Alabama, but worse. Um, it's sort of flat and everyone's cousins and it's full of hard drugs and people think the countryside like milk in a fucking cow or something, you know, it's not really like that in, in this part of the world. Uh, so it looks like Holland, but it's not as nice. And um, so growing up there, uh, but I was naturally very gifted cognitively, you know, um, parents were teachers, when they, when my dad taught anyway, lots of books around, read all the books, literally read all the books, read all the books in the library to the point where they had to get new books in. Um, and I thought, well, I was told, be clever, go to university. You know, my dad was the first from his family that went to university, a classic immigrant story, you know, got to go to university, read all the books. And then I'm 16, 17, and I'm just miserable. I'm suicidally depressed. And, you know, several members of my family had killed themselves, including a cousin I was very close to. And I was alcoholic, like my dad, even though I promised myself I never would. You know, like within a couple of years of drinking, I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> Let's do this every day. <laughs> uh, bad idea, kids, if you're listening. Um, I'd failed in my first intimate relationship, just utterly miserably failed in my first intimate relationship. Uh, I got into a fight, a very minor one, but it was, um, I just realized I couldn't handle myself physically. Um, and I realized I neglected everything from the neck down my whole life. And I went, well, how do you study the body? Because I, I, you know, I was aware that I wasn't really interested in sort of getting a six pack or, you know, the sort of the body of magazines and this sort of thing. You know, I'm aware that just, just didn't really meet my values. But I'm and I looked to sort of Eastern culture and martial arts was what appealed to me because I wanted to, you know, I was actually selling drugs at the time, so I thought I'd better learn to fight because uh, that seemed to be a thing that might happen. Um, and. Uh, I'm told I'm told the police don't take an interest when there's a 20 year gap. I, I really <laughs> hope that's true. No one, I've, done, I've said it a couple of times in interviews. So yeah, I just got <laughs> the body through martial arts. And then I realized there was this whole world. And, you know, I didn't go into the library for the first year while I was at university. So I did go to university, but I, I, I spent most of my time studying martial arts at university, um, sort of on the side of what the psychology I was supposed to be studying. And then naturally I started trying to put the two together, psychology, the body, the Eastern approaches, the Western approaches. And um, there were particular instances I can talk about along this journey, particular turning points, but there was just a gradual like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, this is what I'm interested in. I'm just going to do this from now on. So what did life look like after university? You have what could be classified as quite a traditional degree mixed with an un conventional and untraditional hobby how did you bleed them together yeah yeah i mean i did my dissertation on the psychology of aikido uh, as at the end of my um degree so i kind of brought the two together as best i could and i remember i went to the careers fair for those listening to this you maybe don't know what that is it's like a, a big hall full of stalls and there's different companies there and they'll be fucking globo core and bp and nestle or whatever and like, like hey come sell your soul to us we'll give you some money in exchange for the rest of your life and um and I was just like, nah, mate. <laughs> I was like, yeah, nah. Like, I just walked around. And I honestly, like, joking aside, I was distraught because I thought, shit, this is what's on offer. You know, and I, I really was um, very sad. Like, I left in tears. And I, you know, I cry once a year, maybe, you know. So for me, it was like a big thing to realize, like, shit. And then I said to myself, right, well, if I don't want a proper job, then I should just do what's fun, learn a bit about life. You know, I was 20 when I graduated and I didn't know anything. I hardly done anything but 20. Um, so I basically spent the next seven or eight years living out of a bag, um, studying Aikido whenever I could, living in Aikido dojos, and then between doing odd jobs, like I did a lot of work with kids because you could live on the, like, the kids' centres like PGL, ski resorts, did bar work in Ireland. Gradually got sort of a little bit more... Um, adventurous in what I was doing, going around the world, living in different places, you know, doing lots of martial arts in between, basically living in poverty, but having a really interesting time. Um, and the turning point actually was when um, 
I was invited to help with an event in Cyprus, which was uh, called Training Cross Borders by an organization called Ike Extensions based at the University of Chicago. And they were doing a peace project um, on in the green line, which is the sort of the line, the UN control bit between the Turkish and Greek um, sides of Cyprus. And they had Israelis and Palestinians and Americans and Iraqis and Serbians and, you know, all these kind of different kinds of people that were at war with each other. And they did this project sort of through Aikido and there was trauma work and leadership work. And I sort of realized that Aikido was just the door. And actually, there was a whole work that I would now call embodied work, or, you know, mind-body work. That really, wow, you can do a lot with this beyond... Um, beyond simply twisting people's wrists and throwing them around. And then I just followed that and again, lived out of a bag for a few years doing that, basically sacrificed everything in my life in order to do that. And um, yeah, for a few years, lived in Brazil, and lived with a circus in Ethiopia, uh, spent time in the Middle East, different other places, um, spent time in Cal Northern California with the very rarefied Californian crowd, which drove me fucking nuts. <laughs> um, but they you know, had some good stuff to teach. And uh, yeah, then I came back home and was just like, right, I'm tired of living out of a bag. I'm tired of living in dangerous places and being in poverty. So I thought I'd set up a business. And that was the next period of my life. And that was 15 years ago. So that was the sort of university, the nomadic Aikido bum, and then business, starting business 15 years ago. I absolutely love it. I love how you've had such a varied experience across the globe. I've heard you speak about, speak about um, state and trait. How do do the states and traits of cultures change between the different countries that you've lived in? Yeah, no, great question. I, I'm obsessed with culture. So um, and maybe it's from an immigrant family, maybe it's because I've travelled so much. I've lived in a bunch of places. And, you know, I'm before COVID, I was in like 30 countries a year on average. I think even the last few years, it's been 15 or 20. Um, I'm in Poland now. I'll be in Ukraine next week. I'll be in Italy a couple of weeks later. So I'm, I'm really obsessed with this. You know, I'm married to Ukrainians, so again, cross-cultural marriage. Now, state and trade, just for listeners, so state is something that comes and goes, like, um, you know, you drink uh, beer, you get drunk, right? You drink tea, you get more alert. States can be changed with a breath, with a cup of tea, they can be bash your head against the wall, you can change state relatively quickly. Um, and embodiment teachers teach you more efficient ways to change state, like reduce your stress or wake yourself up. Yeah. Um, Traits are more long-term, more personality-based type things. So I, I tend to think in terms of character rather than personality because it's still semi-changeable. You can change a trait, but you need a lot of practice or a lot of immersion. So um, they're the two main ways you develop a trait over time. So if you, know, if you had two people who were twins and one of them went off did 20 years of tango and the other one went off and did 20 years of Japanese martial arts, they would end up quite different. I'm pretty sure about that. Embodied practices change people. There's a selection bias, but they do change people. Um, and I can and imagine in this time. digital age as well, some people try and think their way into changing traits opposed to immersing yeah. themselves. So many people try to get their whole... Practice or immersion. Yeah, yeah, you practice or immersion. Like, we are still immersed in nervous systems. You know, nervous systems are contagious. So, like... Like, give you an example. When last time I went to Ukraine, me and my mate, Polish Pete, drove back across the border. As soon as we got to Poland, we just both just went, oh, and relaxed. It's like a whole system knew we were being cooked in a different soup. You know, it's like, okay, this is more calm. It's not a war zone. It's a, you know, it's a different country right now in Poland and Ukraine. And Krakow feels different than Warsaw. You know, Krakow's got this kind of educated feel with a bit of touristic kind of vibe. And, you know, Warsaw's different again. And I live in Brighton, which feels different than London. You know, Brighton's like, fun, Brighton. And London's like, fucking Monday morning, get to work, you know, bash, bash, bash. And it's, it's got, as soon as you get off the train, you can feel it in both places. So, so there's always subcultures and subcultural groups, but there is such a thing as culture. And there are ways of being you can learn. You know, the joke is I spent six months in Brazil living above a nightclub doing nothing but fighting, dancing and fucking. And I got back and my mum's like, where did you get those hips? Because I was moving, you know, I wasn't moving like an Englishman. And I can spot Polish people in the street in England. They don't look that different from the average English bloke, but they have a certain embodiment, a lot of tension, chest, for example. Yeah, I like this. Yeah. 
and in Eastern Europe, we see a lot less affect in the face because the trauma, because the um, dorsal vagal shut down, it's called, in the, in the facial features. You know, see that in Ukraine a lot. Um, so, yeah, you know, culture is fascinating to me. Cultures are embodied. Usually it takes me no more than a few days in the country before I get the real feel for it. Though, again, there are, you know, differences within countries, even within cities, whatever. So you don't generalise too much. Um, but, yeah, different... Uh, every culture also influences differently you know if you live in bali it's very chill it's very different than living in new york or moscow it's very different and i don't think anyone would really argue with that so a key part of understanding embodiment is that we're always embodied in place and we're always embodied in culture one thing that i'm very dubious is about is especially being a knowledge worker myself working from home this new hybrid model being so mm. detached from culture and this the city center and from my team and from my colleagues i feel scared in case i don't embody any of the vicarious traits that they have I, i'm scared in case i don't embody anything are you worried about this new kind of working from home model because of that pros and cons right so if all your colleagues are fucked up you're going to get less fucked up that's the good news <laughs> um yeah so in terms of virtual working um so we we co-regulate so we, we're animals like dogs we're pack animals you know we, we we feel calm we reduce stress by togetherness and part of that is this sort of blending into each other you know like old married couples end up looking like each other people that work together there's a vibe there's a culture of football team we'll have it an office we'll have it whatever and you can feel that when you come into an office or a sports team or a new gym where you can feel it um, and that develops far more slowly online. It does develop, but far more slowly. And we're, it's like we're not sharing that. So, you know, we're not even sharing the same time of day. You know, I've got a team all over the world. We're not sharing the same vibe. We're not sharing the same weather. And I think that can mean that conflict and missing each other is way more likely to happen. And I think there's a lot of companies that went virtual with COVID who uh, thought they'd save some money by not going back to an office who were going to regret that in terms of long-term efficiencies and the long-term um, interpersonal problems they'll have. We'll see like less loyal, less cut loyalty, you know, this, uh, le- you know, much more conflict. It's just easier to rub each other up. I mean, social media is the ultimate expression of that. Zoom's a bit bad because at least we can see each other even if the eye contact's a bit weird, right? Like I'm trying to look at the camera <laughs> so you feel, feel like I'm looking at you, but it's a bit difficult. Um, yeah, I, I think we're doing a massive experiment. The other thing is we're... You know, in the office, you go in that, that shake hands in the morning or that pat on the shoulder at the water cooler. Again, that's how we co-regulate. We, we stay sane through other people, right? So also, we, do, we build as teams and reduce conflict that way too. So there's a, there's a few fairly serious consequences that I think are going um, to start ticking through in the next few years. Uh, I believe so too. And I think even from... Uh less so employment point of view, a relationship point of view, I guess I would imagine the figures of online dating has probably increased. Yeah, it's the highest. It's just moved from the most common way to meet a partner. Used to be at work, but that's called sexual harassment now, meeting a partner at work. Uh, So now the most common way to meet a partner is online. That just just overtook it last year, actually. It's in the stats. But I, I totally could imagine that I've bypassed on people online who I would have found really attractive in person because of the way they move, the way they dance, the little idiosyncrasies that they have, like the, the way they wink, the way they, they kind of grin after a, they tell a funny joke. We bypass on all those little subtleties by dating online. And I can imagine I've probably just my pool of potential candidates just by moving uh, my dating efforts online. Well, the good news, David, is they can't smell us either. So again, pros and cons, <laughs> right? But I mean... I mean, actually, jokes aside, smell is massively important to attraction. I think a lot of women are just like, I can't date anything like the smell of them. Like, that's taken out of the picture. And as you say, those, what we call chemistry, that's embodied communication, right? That's embodied messaging that there's two things there exist, well, three things. Polarity, sexual polarity. I've worked a lot with gay people, and gay people have this even more than straight people. Like yin yang, it's not gendered, but it is polarized. If there's going to be a, that's what attraction is. Values, similarity, like there's a vibe, right? Like this girl I just talked to is like, yeah, we're going to go on. You just feel it. You can't feel that. I mean, okay, Cupid, for example, try and do it with values, questions, but it's a vibe. It's not, it's not really just like a set of political beliefs. 
And third one is just pure shadow projection that they, you know, remind you of your mum or some fucked up shit like that. So um, the, the sort of psychological stuff is, again, maybe not so healthy, but is a big part of attraction, unless you're enlightened. So like those three things are all embodied, which is why online dating is um, an awkward experience at best. I absolutely love that insight, Mark. I love it. If we're looking to develop a rudimentary pa- practice, how do you start a basic embodiment practice? Where, 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 where do we look? And yeah, do we I would say anything you enjoy that you feel your body. So uh, there's different levels. I'd answer this if you're if I'm training life coaches or yoga teachers, it might be another level, right? But when I'm just working with someone, it's like, hey, I feel like I'm a bit calm for myself. Maybe that's not such a good thing. You know, I want to be a bit more connected to myself. I want to be a bit better regulated. Maybe as their driver. Um, you know, I have too many moods, whatever it is. I'd say just find anything with body awareness and just fall in love with it. Like I did with Aikido. Like I could say, yeah, but this builds that skill and, you know, yoga builds more self-regulation, but not so much self-expression and this kind of dance is more self-expression than self-regulation. I could fine tune it for anyone, but the key thing is just find something you enjoy where you feel your body. And what, what I mean for your body, not super intense because while you know kinky sex or hot yoga or heavy weightlifting is a lot of fun not all three at once kids if you're listening um but while those things are a lot of fun you become dependent upon those things so so when people say like running's my meditation i'm like yeah well good luck with meditating when you can't run like in a meeting or something right so i'd say it needs to be gentle enough to have some kind of transfer into the rest of your life but generally i just say like if you're feeling your body and you enjoy it Feel your boots. Honestly, most people, the body can be scary if you have trauma backgrounds and stuff like that. But generally, it just feels good to be in your body. Like most, there's a reason people like dancing. There's a, you know, once they loosen up a bit at the wedding or whatever, there's, you know, even your dad gets on the dance floor. There's a reason people like moving. Sex is still popular despite the internet. Apparently. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Apparently, I've heard once I remember. It's been a long time. So, uh, yeah. So I mean, so it's like the body will naturally open up, and just its gifts and its beauty and its uh, poetry and its 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 just fun will just start being offered, and then that then you're hooked. You know, that's a self sustaining journey. So that's for beginners, and then if you've been doing one thing for a while, you'll probably be getting diminishing returns. And this is where I'd say, like a lot of listeners might have had a yoga practice or you know martial arts practice. Is it still building the skill that you want to build? Or are you getting just increasingly neurotic and increasingly, you know, thinking everything's a nail because you've got a hammer? You know, this is where we have to be a little bit careful. I love it, Mark. Can we speak about Ukraine? I saw you do what I think is, I believe is called polyvagal training with a bunch of young children. What, what is that and what have you been doing and what results have you seen from it? Okay, polyvagal theory comes from Stephen Porges and Deb Stainer. Uh, so they studied neurology and found out that there's um, a stress level that's hierarchical. We have a fight flight response you may have heard of. We have a freeze response, but we also have this co-regulatory way we connect. And that's the primary way we regulate as human beings. So it's really an understanding of the nervous system that's more sophisticated than you got taught in your sort of A-level, you know, biology or whatever. Um, and uh, it can be taught in relatively complex theoretical ways. But I just use a traffic lights model and be like, you green light, you yellow light, orange light or red light, we'll talk about it in my team. Um, and one of the trainers uh, uh, that I trained in Ukraine, I've trained like a whole bunch of trainers to work with trauma education in Ukraine. Uh, one of them, she was working with children, so she adapted it uh, to using SpongeBob SquarePants characters um to talk about the different states of uh, or, you know whether it's sympathetic nervous system or, you know you can't talk to a 10 year old about sympathetic nervous system arousal it's not gonna you know it's, and these are like six or eight year olds actually but you can talk to them about going into a certain mode you know and it depends who you're working with like language is important for making things accessible like i work with one businesswoman a romanian and she talked about cat mode and that just meant very calm and chill and relaxed and I said, okay, how do cats breathe? And then we taught us some diaphragmatic breathing. Okay, what's the muscle tone like? Okay, do cats get anxious about stuff? All right. So, you know, then we put cat stickers all over her computer to remind her because she loves cats, you see, this is her thing. Um, so whether you're working with kids or executives love cats or, you know, some of my team work with soldiers. I'm working with Polish volunteers and working with refugees in the next couple of days. 
like you have to language things differently, put things in different words, maybe change, you know, add the SpongeBob SquarePants characters to the diagram or whatever, but really it's the same concept. I saw this, um, I think it was a clip of you playing with children, mimicking the emotions of a cat and you work your way up to being a tiger. What does that do for the yeah. stress response? The last time I was here in Poland, there was a, a party and there was lots of refugees straight from the war. There was one kid that just like she had kind of a bad time and she's got a lot of that fight flight response. So she's sort of scared of people. So how do you make yourself less scary as a you know rough, tough, big, muscly guy like me? So I pretended to be a kitten, which she found really funny. And then gradually, as we sort of built that connection and trust, bear in mind, she didn't speak English. I don't speak Polish or Ukrainian at that time. Uh, and ended up uh, taking her from sort of that mode. And then I became like a tiger. And I was like chasing her around the room, like helping her discharge some of that flight response, which was stuck in her body. Um, and then in the end, she started like riding me around. And it's like literally like, sitting on me as I was walking. You know, there's a great little video of this. Um, and there's actually a book on trauma called Riding the Tiger by a very famous guy called Peter Levine, which is hilarious because I didn't realize that was what's going on. But it's like conquering her fear and literally like riding the fear around. So we obviously she wasn't scared of tigers. She was scared of um, the, the war or being bombed or whatever had happened to the, the poor little darling. But we just turned it into a tiger. And then, you know, she found, we took her through these polyvagal states. And the end, the cutest thing was the end she came and just slept on me. So I was sitting there, like, just chilling. And she just literally, I didn't know this kid, remember? Just literally just comes and sleeps on me. And her mum's there, and her mum's like, oh, I'm really sorry. I, I just, that she doesn't normally do this. And I'm like, no, no, she's just chill. Because she'd gone into that rest and digest mode. But first, she, you know, that's what we call green light, rest and digest. But first, she'd had to burn off some of that charge and have that empowering experience. So it was, it was very instinctive. I've worked with like 50,000 kids, so it's sort of instinctive. It's not like a plan. I mean, any play therapist would probably understand what I did there, I think. That's magnificent. That's absolutely magnificent. And it's one of those things that you can't really measure the success of it with a metric or a piece of data. It's just, you have to embody the, the success of what you have done for that individual. It's so hard to metricize, right? Yeah, though, you see a nervous system change like that, going from someone who's sort of cowering in a corner to asleep on your lap. You know, that's there's a very definite uh, nervous system shift there, you know. And at the end of the night, I was leaving, she kept hugging my leg, and the mum kept apologising in Ukrainian. I was like, no, it's all right, it's all right. Because she didn't understand what happened, you know. She just got, you know, sort of a bit attached to me, as it were, because she had this nice experience. But it's, um, you know, that's an instinctive thing if you've got a lot of embodiment training. You know, it's like um, good leadership, knowing what to say at the right time, just being a bit calmer than everyone else sometimes. And I don't always model it perfectly. You know, I definitely struggle with my own self-regulation um, in finance meetings, talking about taxes, you know, we'll, we all have <laughs> our Achilles heels. Um, but it's, uh, you know, those are embodied skills that you learn and, and transferring them from meditation and yoga and martial arts and dance to whatever context you're in, you know, whether that be flirting with someone in an airplane, you know, on the plane or, um, being on a podcast well. Mark, knowing that you have to go pretty soon, I'm going to finalize on one yeah. question. Knowing what you know now, embodying yeah. everything that you've embodied and visiting and experiencing all the cultures that you have, if you could go back and be a support system for 16-year-old Mark, oh. whose dad's an alcoholic, who's oh. so well-read but still depressed, what would what's one universal lesson or one universal I would have. I would have... First of all, he wouldn't listen to me anyway. Um, so wouldn't not, not much I could really say at that point, you know. I, I think I would have strongly encouraged him to join a martial arts dojo a few years before he did, because I think he would have actually liked it at 15, 16, as opposed to 18, and would have been very, very healthy to be doing that at a slightly younger age. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd uh, also I'd tell him about buying Bitcoin. <laughs> But they're, they're the two things they're the two things oh i love it i've loved this session it's been a very full circle moment for me mark i enjoyed your podcast with chris williamson on modern wisdom that's how i was introduced to your work oh great yeah chris great guys got some awesome guests on people should check him out for sure yeah. definitely but if people want to check you out mark where can people find you and your work online how you can want you check me out okay uh, so my company's called embodiment unlimited and embodimentunlimited.com has got free classes 
uh, free videos, free PDFs, free eBooks, loads of good stuff there. If people are interested, just go look at just all there for free. Uh, embodimentunlimited.com. If they do social media, they can find me on Instagram, YouTube. Apparently I'm on TikTok now, which is a bit disturbing. Uh, someone put me on there, but a bunch of other places. I've got books on Amazon. If you just put the word embodiment into the internet, everything comes up. But the main one is embodimentunlimited.com. I love it, Mark. I'll make sure to link everything in the show notes below. Thank you for your time. I really, really it. It's a real pleasure. Shoot me a WhatsApp if you're ever uh, this down south from Brighton, then give me a shout.